Well, welcome in. It's another week, another podcast, whether or not. I'm your host, meteorologist Scott Sumner. This week, I had to talk to a state local and talked with uh, Stephen uh, Saro. He is the senior curator at the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. He had a lot to say and a lot of good information regarding the animals there, of course, a new baby gorilla, and how weather impacts the animals. Take a look. Welcome into another week of Weather or Not podcast. I'm your host, meteorologist Scott Sumner. With me is Stephen Saro, and he is actually the senior curator for the, now this is a tongue twister, folks, Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. <laughs> Welcome in, Stephen. Thank you so much for being with us here. Hi, Scott. Thanks for asking me to join you. I appreciate Absolutely it. Absolutely appreciate it. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the position uh, you are currently in. Sure, you betcha. I have been in the zoo business for over 40 years, so I've been around the block a couple times. Um, I started up at a small zoo in Delaware, the Brandywine Zoo, and then eventually got to the Maryland Zoo as a keeper, uh, was there for 20 years, and continued my quest to move up in the zoo world. Made it to the National Aviary in Pittsburgh as director of animal programs. And then I got a call from the Smithsonian and they said, hey, come on down and work for us. Be a curator down here. So I was like, it's the Smithsonian, gotta do it. So that's Absolutely. why I came down. Absolutely, yeah, it's uh, some good stuff there. Absolutely. and. Uh... You know, uh, with this, in this day and age where you have the internet and and obviously you know people can find other people for jobs a lot easier these days than they did in the past. Uh, so the, congratulations on the position, by the way. Well, thank you. It's been um, fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and also too, I got to say, we'll start off with this. Uh, recently, there was a uh, baby gorilla uh, born in uh, the uh, the zoo here, uh, and you had put out a poll for names. You got the names. Um, how big a response did you get on that poll? Well, you know, I wasn't a hundred percent. So I asked the curator of primates what the poll number was, and she wasn't sure. She has the numbers, but she said it was astronomical. We got a lot, a lot of names. So the the baby was born on May twenty seventh, and the basically the the choice turned out to be Zara. Z A H R A, and she's cute as a bug's ear. I'm sure she's doing well. This is a couple months now. Very, after, very well. After she's been born, good, good. And you know, it's obviously exciting to have a newborn on site. Um, but how are you integrating the baby to its elements? Well, she's being, you know, raised by her mom, so mom doesn't let her out of her sight. Um, she's cradling the baby just about all the time. And one of the things we do is we make sure we monitor all the temperatures inside and out. And we have protocols with uh, temperature ranges of what's best for them, for pretty much all the animals here at the zoo. And on really, really hot days, sometimes the animals will have free access. You know, we'll allow them outside or they can come in inside. It's their choice. So, uh, so far, the baby, who is just an infant, is pretty much doing whatever mom wants to do. So, is, is it difficult, Stephen, to get to the child, to the baby a gorilla, to, to do any readings? or Because uh, obviously the mother is very protective. So, you know, how, how does that work? Well, we do training. So, what the is in with training, just like you train your dog to come and sit and do certain behaviors. We do operant conditioning and training with our animals. So Kalea, the, the mom, is trained to come over and actually sit next to the, the mesh for the keepers to observe the baby and see how the baby's doing. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's, all, it's all food rewards, you know? If she's, if she's good, she comes over, she gets a treat. Oh, perfect, perfect. How do you actually uh, find animals for the zoo? Well, that, that's a really good question, Scott. Um, 
we are part of an organization called AZA, the Association of um, Zoos and Aquariums. And it's an accredited organization. So we're one of the members, 240 members. And we have breeding programs. And each of the animals that are in these breeding programs have recommendations who they should be bred to and not. And we produce offspring that can go to other zoos. So let's say we wanted to get a new tiger. We would contact the Tiger Species Survival Plan. That's what they're called, SSPs. Yeah. And say, we have space for a tiger. We would like a Sumatran tiger because there's six different species of tigers. And we have a female here already. We would like to breed it. Do you have a male available? And we work within that group of zoos to see when that tiger will be available. It might be available now. It might be available in two years. You know, so we do a lot of collection planning here. Um, and then when they when we um, get them, get an, uh, an arrangement for them to come in, we start going through um, how do we transport them? Do we have to have them trained to go into a crate, which is usually the case in some yeah. of these animals, some of the larger ones. And then we make travel arrangements, like I said, and that can be either plane or we, there are a number of different um, ground transportation companies that are out there that can actually move um, animals around. So we just brought in two new uh, Schwozwalski's horses for our, up on Olmsted and they came from Front Royal. They could have come in by trailer. Uh, we actually just trailed them in our staff from Front Royal, um, but we could have brought in a, a transporter to bring them in. So there's lots of different ways of getting them in. Okay. Uh, how do you know? I mean, you, you only have so much space at the zoo, uh, mm -hmm. so you and, and you don't want to overcrowd, of course. Uh, so how do you, is 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 it's currently, you kind of surveying on a, a week, a month, a, a basis or a yearly basis, like, okay, we've still got a little bit more room here. Um, this is the area. And now is that how you go about it? Like, okay, say it's yeah. the bird section and now, okay, we need a bird. You know, is that, is that how you break it down? Literally, is it in simplicity? Kind of. What we need to do is look at the space that we're, that we have available and then decide what would be a good species to join that space with the rest of the collection, okay? In a lot of cases, we try to do mixed species exhibits. So there's some up at the small mammal house. So what species can actually cohabitate with others? Um, can an armadillo live with a tamarind? Yeah. Can the sloths live with a golden lion tamarind? Yeah, that works just fine. Can a lion live with a zebra? No. So, you know, we have to look at the space and then the confines of that space. And now I know all your folks have been out here. They've seen the lion and tiger exhibits and there's a large moat um, that keeps the animals in. So if one of those exhibits was open, we'd probably see well, is it best to get more lions or tigers, or could we go with a different species? Could we do maybe hyenas? Not that there's plans to bring hyenas in, but hyenas would probably work well for those species or for those spaces. Right. Now, you also, I, I'd be remiss to say, you know, this is a weather or not podcast, so I have to bring weather into, the, into play course. here. And the reason why I actually wanted to reach out to you and talk about that. So uh, not only do you have to consider what you just said, uh, does species go with species, et cetera. But you probably also have to consider the weather elements here in the Washington, D.C. area because we are more of a, thankfully, a mid-latitude. We're not tropical. We're not, you know, really cold if you're up in Maine, uh, such, you know, where you have temperatures in the 30s and 40s sometimes in the summer. So um, you have to take that into account. Uh, what have you found through your experience and your years working? What animals do best in this general vicinity? Well, you're, you're, it's not just, you're, you're, it's a great question because the ambient temperature out, outside year round dictates whether we can exhibit animals outside. 
Okay. So uh -huh. think of the Aldabra tortoises. We have them. They can, they're reptiles. You know, they're giant tortoises. There's only uh, six months or so that they can be in their outside exhibit. You know, they cannot handle the cold temperatures. So we have to have a warm area inside for them, which they have. Um, the exact opposite are the pandas. You knew I was going to bring up pandas, right? I knew. I knew. Pandas yeah. are like so the pandas, they don't like the warm, hot weather. They're very, very much uh, mountain and, and cooler forest kind of species. So they have air conditioning inside. So during the summer, the hot dog days of summer, they'll be outside for maybe a half hour or so while we're cleaning the inside. And then they come right back inside. So we take the natural history of each species into account when we're trying to figure out what will be a good species to have at the zoo here and that it would thrive. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of planning involved here. I mean, people absolutely. don't consider, they just show up at the zoo. Hey, this is wonderful. Look at, look at X, Y, and Z. But the amount of planning that you guys go through specifically to get everything in place is pretty magnificent and uh, interesting. Yes, absolutely. We have it, lots of meetings about that. Oh, I, I can imagine. You know, so I, I, I went a little further here. Um, you know, we've had a pretty much, I would say, a fairly hot summer and quite a bit of haze coming in for the smoke and the wildfires coming in from Canada. So, uh, which isn't, you know, I wouldn't say, it seems like it's been a little bit more above normal than an average summer. Um, so how to like, you know, I looked at some of your animals there, gray wolves, uh, river otters. How do they respond to some of these elements there? And also, as a little addendum to that question, uh, you on the website, you've listed animals that we wouldn't see in conditions below 50 degrees. Um, what type of animals are not usually seen in that type of uh, or are not seen above uh, 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 below 50 degree conditions? Well, OK. Um... Let's jump into your first part of that question first. The the haziness and such, we would often give the and the, the very, very hot temperatures, we would give the animals the the option to be outside. And on those hazy days when the air quality was bad, we would just try to keep them in as much as possible. Okay. So, so that that's it's all about the animal welfare, making sure that the animals are comfortable. And what's comfortable for the animals generally is comfortable for the people too, you know, our yeah. guests. Um, for the temperatures, if you if you're wandering through Asia Trail, so you have the one there, the the giant pandas that love cold weather. Then you have the sloth bears at the opposite side of the the range, and then the the otters that are up there, the Asian otters, they like it really warm. So for them, they're kind of okay with the temperatures when it gets really, really warm. So they tend to not be seen in our winter. You know, we keep them in because the temperatures gets too cold. Um, and they'll, they'll, they handle the temperatures much better than a lot of other species. Red pandas is another one. We have red pandas down by the giant pandas. They like the cold. So we actually have their, their, um, exhibit um, the holding area of the building air conditioned so and we have a window in it so you can actually still see red pandas but they're out there in the winter they just love it out in the winter oh I bet yeah just they're they're <laughs> awesome animals you'll see them in the winter outside and sometimes in the summer what about uh, a question I didn't have uh, on my list and I just thought of now that you bring that up what about if there was a blizzard or something like that? Um, you know, the, the animals that love the cold, I'm sure they'd want to stay outside. Do they stay outside in the conditions like that? Or do they all have to go inside? Well, it depends on the severity of the storm. So we've had blizzards here before. We've had heavy snowfalls. And you kind of gauge it on the animal. So think about like the bison. We have a bison exhibit. And we have two two female bison up there. Again, they like cold better than they like heat, but they're also built for winter. You know, their their heads are massive. 
when they feed, they push the snow away with their heads. So they're totally fine going out in snow. The I know you and all your your viewers have seen the videos of the pandas rolling down the hills in the snow. You know, they 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 love it. The North American otters are okay with it too. Not the Asian otters, but the North American otters. They love the snow. So it's all dependent on the species. And if we did have true lizard conditions with heavy snowfall, significant, you know, foot or two, we might just keep them in just to make sure that they were safe because we don't want them slipping in the snow. No, no. It's, and the same would go for uh, a tropical system. You know, if we have the remnants of a hurricane or something coming up here, then Absolutely. obviously you do, you would do the same thing. Do you have any... Uh, anything in the flooring in the in the exhibits that be either cools or heats uh the room yeah we have um the the ramp at bison is actually heated to try and keep the snowfall at a minimum um i believe the elephants have a heated floor so there there's we take all of that into account you know when we're designing things right uh two more questions for you here yeah. Stephen. um you know, have you added any new exhibits since last year? And what new attractions can people look forward to uh, coming to visit the say this summer? Well, one of the things, see my hat? This I, is one of the new birdhouse hats. We oh. have a brand new birdhouse just opened. We have been closed for about six years. We've just opened it. We have three very large, nice aviaries. The first one is uh, Delaware Bay. So it's an estuarine system that, that's very similar we, the, to species that you'll see in the Delaware Bay. The next is Prairie Pothole, where we have normally waterfowl, but they've been moved out for the summer. But we still have some passerines, red-winged blackbirds and such in there. And then the third exhibit is incredible. That's the coffee farm. So it's a Central American coffee farm. And if you go in... The cool thing is not only do you see species that you would see in, in Central America, but you will see a lot of what are called neotropical migrants. They're the birds that are up here in the summer, but then move, migrate south for the winter. Okay, they come up here to take advantage of the bugs and the, the habitat. Uh -huh. So think, think of your Baltimore Oriole. They're up here in the summer. They're down in Central America in the fall. So you get to see them. Cedar wax wings. We have a dozen species of warblers up there. They're, they're, it's a great exhibit. Sounds that way. Sounds that way. You know, I really do need to get out there uh, and see you guys because I, I'm, you're not that far <laughs> from no, where I am. So I, I, should, I should take advantage of that. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting also to see online events on your website. Uh, what can uh, we expect going into uh, any of these events upcoming? Well, we've got, uh, we're, we're working on what's coming up in fall. Just one of the things I did want to mention, we brought in um, a good friend of ours uh, named Fung Lu. He has a company that he actually does bird demonstrations. So he's out in front of the birdhouse with a free flight bird program, which is pretty cool. You can see, uh, Hornbills and owls, uh, conyers just flying around. And basically, it's a good conservation message for everybody to see that we have two shows per day um, on Wednesdays through Mondays and 1030 in the morning and then one in the afternoon. They run about an hour. Definitely worthwhile. Coming up this fall, we are planning on doing Boo at the Zoo which is another wonderful experience. But what's that? That is where we open up the zoo in the evening and kids can dress up and come in a safe, happy environment and see the zoo. Okay, great, great. Well, uh, I tell you, Stephen, a lot of good stuff happening there, as you just mentioned. Uh, so as a final plug, uh, you know, please let people know uh, here where they can find you and, and find out more information. Uh, about the Smithsonian National Zoo? Sure. We have a website. All you need to do is Google Nas National Zoo, and it comes up. 
Um, and that's the easiest place to get details. Are you on Facebook or Twitter or any other? Uh, we are. We okay. are on Facebook. Yes. Good. Good. So, and I, I believe Twitter too. I am. I am. I'm definitely not a techie. So, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do know Facebook. We are on Facebook. If you wanted to look it up, look us up. Okay. So good information there, folks. Uh, obviously, as Stephen said, go to the website or check them out on their Facebook page, and you get all the information, hours, details, events, everything coming up here and uh, it's a good time to go uh you know people are wanting to get out now after several years of obviously the pandemic so now uh is is a good time in any to get out to the zoo and see what uh, exhibits you have out there thank you so much Stephen, for your time i much appreciate it well that's a wrap up for this week's podcast as always god bless be well stay safe and we'll see you next week <laughs>